Many thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this week's video. I think I've finally come to the conclusion that composition is my hands down favorite landscape photography topic to discuss. And I firmly believe that the fastest way for one to improve their landscape photography is by focusing their attention on developing compositional skills. Now, from an outdoor photography perspective, whenever I think of composition, I can't help but also think about the problem that we're trying to solve. And I think a lot of this is probably carryover from my many years spent in the corporate world where I was kind of conditioned to seek out problems and then develop solutions to solve those problems. And the compositional issue I'm referencing here is how do we accurately translate the, the three-dimensional landscape that we see with our naked eye into the kind of the two-dimensional medium that is photography? Now, I don't think this problem exists with each and every scene that you may encounter, but I have noticed that over the, the past few years, many of my compositions have drastically been improved by focusing on the solution to this problem. And that's really the purpose of this week's video is to discuss three different ways you can create depth in your compositions and add that three-dimensional quality back into your images, ultimately creating more impactful and dynamic landscape photos. Now, before we jump right into it, I first want to show you some, some aerial photos that uh, I don't think I've ever shown these on this channel before, but I think these are great illustrations of uh, photographs that have little to no depth associated with them. So here's a, a classic image of a kind of just a top-down view of uh, just, you know, water crashing up on a shore. There's literally, there, there is no depth in this photograph whatsoever. And here is another image right here. This is just a, a curvy road in, uh, in Maui. And once again, it's a great photograph. I love the image, but there's just no depth to this image at all. And here's another scene. Now, now you'll notice that as I go through these next couple images that the, the amount of depth in these photographs slowly increases just a little bit. So pay close attention to that. And in this image right here, you know, there, there's not a lot of depth, but you can start to see, you know, obviously this is a pier and there's got to be an area beneath the pier and you can see the shadow right through here. So there is a little bit of depth appearing in this image right here. And here's another photograph right here of just these uh, snow covered uh, pine trees. And you can start to see a little bit of depth, especially when you look through kind of these pockets or, or, or breaks in the pine trees, you can see kind of the tree trunks going down here. And you can start to see that there is a little bit of depth in this image right here as well. And then once again, right here, there's a little area right here in the foreground somewhere and you can kind of feel how it kind of leads into this area right here, this area here, feels like it's farther away from the viewer than this area here. So that kind of creates that illusion that there, there is a little bit of depth, there is a little separation in this image right here as well. And in this next photograph here, this was shot with a uh, 70 to 200 lens and there's not a ton of depth in the photograph, but you can, you can see that there, there's a water area right here, of course, in the foreground. And then you have the mountains in the background, or I guess you could, maybe you could say this is the mid ground and then the area, the, the color in the sky is the background, but there's not a lot of depth in this photograph, but you can see how there's a little bit more depth in this image than the very first images that we were looking at. And I think this is just a great exercise to kind of go through just to uh, illustrate images that have no depth and just kind of use this as a, a reference point, if you will. Now, the very first way, and this probably the most common way to create depth in, in photography is by looking for that, that foreground, the midground, and the background, that classic scenario. And here's a, a great example right here. I know I've shown this image uh, quite a few times uh, over the last few months, but I think this is just a, a fantastic example of an image that has a very clear foreground, which is this rock here in, in, the, uh, in the bottom of the frame. And then you have a very clear midground, which is this rock right here. And then you have the waterfall in the background. And this really gives the eye an area to kind of lock on and just kind of walk that optical journey or that visual path throughout your image. And that's kind of the goal is to get the viewer to see the entire the image in its I guess in its totality in the foreground, midground, background is a great way to do that because that's going to ensure that the viewer sees that foreground and is going to be able to see the midground. And the midground is really what separates the foreground from the background. And then the viewer will see the background as well. And they'll be able to explore the entire image. And that's kind of that that optical journey. Here's another great example here where you have a very, very clear area in the foreground right through here. And you got this area in the midground, And then of course you got the river in the background and the canyons and the sky. And it's just very, very clear to see that kind of depth in the overall, overall image. And it gives that kind of, uh, uh, what do you say? Just um, immersive feeling in the overall photograph. 
Here's another great example. It rocks clearly in the foreground right through here. You got the water cascading, this waterfall right through here, and this giant boulder in the midground. And then you have the uh, the grist mill and the autumn trees in the background and creates a just very um, three-dimensional looking image. Because when we when I saw this image in real life, I could feel the depth. It was very easy to see. But then when you bring it home and you're looking at it, it just doesn't feel the same way. But by focusing on the layers of the scene, that foreground, midground, background, you're able to kind of add that three-dimensional quality back in. And here's another great example right here. And in, in this image, it's not quite as obvious. And I think that's probably something I, I think is very important about this overall video is that each of these techniques, sometimes you find situations where it's very obvious what the uh, the approach is to be used. And then there's other situations where you kind of have to dig a little bit deeper. And when I look at this photograph, I immediately I really don't clearly see the, the foreground, midground, background. But when you think about it a little bit more, this area right here, the reflection, is clearly the foreground. And then you have the trees in this field and this little pond right here are, is in the, uh, the midground. And then you have the waterfall, which is, it serves in the background. And reflections is a great way to do that. Almost any time you're using reflections in your scene, you almost always will automatically have a foreground interest, and that's going to be that reflection. And in this image right here, once again, it might not be super obvious where the layers are. I mean, clearly you have the tree and the, or the volcanic rock down here in the foreground. Then you have the mountains in the background and the color in the sky. But the midground is actually just this water right here. The water separating the foreground from the background. And whenever I think of foreground, midground, background, that midground layer is really the main purpose for me is to separate the foreground from the background. And creating that separation is what really makes the foreground, midground, background uh, concept really kind of pull that together. Here's another example right here, which is one of my favorite images as far as adding three dimension back into the uh, into the photograph, where you have clear areas of foreground, midground. You got lots of areas of midground right through here. You got this tree kind of pointing into this area in the background. Sun kind of coming through the autumn trees up here, which is the brightest area of the scene, which is where the human eye is always going to gravitate to anyway. So just all of these things for the human eye to kind of just lock onto and just kind of follow the path of this water all the way up to the, uh, the actual background. Now the next approach, and this is a, also a fairly common approach. I don't think it's as popular as the foreground, midground, background approach, but it's looking for leading lines and repeating patterns. And once again, sometimes this is very obvious and other times it's not so clear. But in this image right here is very obvious. This is from the Oregon coast where I had my camera very low. As soon as the waves passed myself and the camera and they started to retreat back out, then I would snap the photograph whoops, and ultimately creating these just very nice immersive lines that just kind of pull the viewer's eye into the photograph. And also the brightest area of the scene is right here as well. And in this image, once again, very obvious, you have the footsteps kind of leading up to this uh, snow blown tree right through here. And then you have these paths right through here, so more repeating patterns. And just a lot of things for the viewer's eye to just kind of lock onto that'll draw them into the photograph for that kind of optical journey throughout your image. And in this image, very obvious right here, what the, uh, the leading line is. You have the boardwalk position on the right side, which leads all the way up to the lighthouse right here that's receiving some of the, uh, the rising sun right through there. So once again, this scenario is very obvious what the leading line is and the repeating patterns. Now in this situation is here, once again, very obvious. You have this staircase right here, very clear foreground right through here that just kind of walk the viewer's eye up and around and into the background area of the photograph. Now in this situation right here, it might not be quite as obvious. And this is uh, of course taken from a helicopter and you have the helicopter right here in your foreground. And I was just kind of hanging my arm outside of the helicopter and just kind of spraying and praying and taking a ton of photos and hoping that something is going to come out. And this was my favorite of the scene. And the, the actual kind of leading line right through here, repeating patterns is really just this, this coastline that just kind of pulls the viewer's eye all the way up until this area right through here. And it creates a lot of depth especially with the, the helicopter right here. And you can just easily see this. And you could see that this could be considered repeating patterns. This could be considered leading lines. But this is a great example of a, a scenario that might not be as obvious when you first look at it. And then right here, once again, maybe not as obvious as some of the, the, the staircase or the, the, the boardwalk scenario. But you have these kind of waves just kind of pulling back right through here that creates these kind of leading line effects kind of draw the viewer's eye up until this area right here, which is where the reflection is, which ultimately will draw the eye up to uh, the Golden Gate Bridge in the background. So just kind of focusing on 
the situations there where it might not be so obvious because there's there's tons of those in landscape photography where you encounter the the composition and it'll hit you like a you know a ton of bricks it's obvious what uh you know how to create depth in that photograph but other times you kind of got to dig a little bit deeper now the third kind of i guess technique that i'd like to focus on is framing up my subject and i think this is a fantastic way to create or to add that three-dimensional quality back into your photographs and this is a, a very obvious example right here this is uh i believe in arches national park this is in the, the window section of the uh the park where you have this very natural you know, kind of stone area right through here which is the window that's framing up the subject right through here. And this obviously creates a lot of depth. This is clearly in the foreground right through here. And in this area right through here is in the midground and in the background. So that creates that very immersive look that you can almost reach into the photograph, which is something that I'm always trying to, uh, to create in, in, uh, in my photos. And in here, this is a very classic shot, once again, of the Golden Gate Bridge, kind of looking through these trees right here. These are just super you know, gnarly, cool looking trees, especially when you get some of the uh, setting sun that kind of just really illuminates the side of these trees and you get all this amazing texture. And then you put the Golden Gate Bridge smack in the middle of the trees and it just creates that, that real three-dimensional look by framing up the overall subject. And then once again, using trees to frame the image. This is Yosemite Falls. This is once again, another classic shot where these huge, I believe these are pine trees, and you put the Yosemite Falls right in the middle of the trees and it just frames it up absolutely perfectly. Now, in some situations, much like everything in this video, there's very obvious situations and sometimes where it's not so obvious. In this scenario right here, it's kind of in the middle. It's somewhat obvious. It's maybe not as obvious as the previous two examples. But you have this small tree right here, these beautiful autumn leaves. And then you have this kind of shrub area right through here that's not quite as organized as that tree. But the waterfall is falling directly between the two. And those two trees is kind of framing up your actual subject. And then right here, once again, not quite as obvious, but you have this tree right here, or this dead tree in the in the tide, or in the, 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 I guess the ocean. And then you have another one laying down right here. And these two are kind of framing up this tree right here, which is kind of reaching its arms over these other two trees, almost like they're kind of holding them in place. But once again, those two trees on the left and the right side are framing up the main subject here, which is this tree in the center. And then once again, this one is definitely not nearly as obvious as the other ones either, but you have this kind of mossy tree right here, kind of pointing over into this area, kind of framing this side. And then you got the bend in the river and the autumn trees kind of framing over here. And it's just, it's all kind of framing in the center of the actual photograph. So it's not always so obvious, but using or looking for foreground, midground, background, or looking for leading lines and repeating patterns, or trying to figure out a way to frame your actual subject or the main area of interest in your photograph are all just absolutely fantastic ways to add that three-dimensional quality back into our two-dimensional photographs. So I hope you're able to, to pick up some helpful information that you can apply to your compositional skills uh, moving forward the next time you're on location. And before I do wrap up this week's video, I do wanna say just a, a big thanks again to, to Squarespace, who's the sponsor of this week's video and who I use for literally every single aspect of my website. Squarespace provides a dynamic and attractive online platform to create your website. You can display your photography using Squarespace's professional portfolio designs and customize the layout and look and feel of your gallery in order to make it your own. With Squarespace's traffic overview feature, you can track trends and page visits and views to better optimize your content. You can even grow and engage with your customers with Squarespace's email campaign tools, which enables you to create engaging emails that match your website with your products, blog posts, and logo, just so your messaging remains consistent. So if you're looking to start a new website or perhaps enhance your current website, go to squarespace.com forward slash Mark Denny for a free trial and 10% off your first purchase. So I hope you enjoyed this week's video. As always, if you have any questions, please leave those in the comments section below and I guarantee you I will get back in touch with you. And if you did enjoy this week's video, if you could give it that thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed already. And as always, I really do appreciate you watching this week's video and I will see you all next week. Bye.